G'day, Chris here and welcome back to ClickSpring. So with the main plate complete, next up are the various components for the clamp assemblies. And starting with the jaws, there are some interesting features to be formed. Some are essential for the clamps to do their job, such as the holes and recesses. And others, like the styled profile and curves, are typical of the watchmaker tool aesthetic. For materials, I'm using ground flat stock. It's capable of being hardened, although it won't need to be in this case. It'll do fine in its annealed state. But it does provide the benefit of precisely dimensioned raw stock. In this case, given the critical lower jaw height without effort, and given that the clamps are matching parts, their features can be reliably positioned by pairing them as they're formed. As always, a better glue bond will form with completely clean surfaces. And in this case, I allowed a couple of hours for the glue to cure. Now, super glue can be quite effective at holding apart for machining but it's very susceptible to brittle fracture if wedged or levered. And this fact can be used to advantage when the time comes to separate the parts. The cuts begin with the various holes to accept the tapped insert, spring and the lifting screw. And with the holes formed, the superglue bond can be broken to allow the rest of the features in the bottom jaw to be formed. In this case, I'd like the bottoms of these openings to be neatly squared off to accept the clamping hardware. So I'm using end mills to open up the holes, progressively setting up for the final cut to take off as little material as possible, and so leave the best possible finish. And with the holes now at the correct size and depth, this small section of excess material at the end can come off in preparation for the profiling work. Okay, so that's the functional aspects of the clamp jaws in place. Next up is the formation of the various curves that make up their profile the first of which are the arcs that define the perimeters of each jaw. Again, there's an obvious benefit in carrying out this cut with the parts paired together as before. And it also happens to be a perfect job for the machine on which the clamps will eventually be used, because the lathe is well suited to accurately cutting this sort of precise sweeping arc. And by creating the features with a turned cut, an opportunity presents to take advantage of the natural symmetry of the parts. So I've made a simple fixture that'll securely hold all surfaces to the cutting tool at the required radius. And by using a set of interchangeable locating pins and sleeves that fit snugly in both the locating holes of the fixture and the parts, everything can be repeatedly brought into alignment for each cut.
The parts are now located relative to the fixture, so all that's required is to locate the fixture itself on the lathe axis, in this case by dialing it in with a forge or chuck. Now of course this is a very small lathe and an interrupted cut, so it's worth taking things carefully from the start. And as always, it's worth doing a quick progress check after a few passes, to make sure all is going as expected. It's not uncommon for an interrupted cut to chip the cutting tool, so a check when close to final dimension is a last chance to pick up any issues with the surface finish. If the tool maybe needs to be resharpened, or if something else is amiss, now is the time to fix it, to get the best possible result on the final pass. OK, so that's one side complete. And of course we can get the same result for the other side, by simply swapping the positions of the parts. Strictly speaking, the fixture can stay in the chuck as the positions are changed, but I've taken it out to give a clearer view of the changeover. Now as the cutting tool exits the workpiece, it'll inevitably raise a small burr, which if left in place would upset the seating of the part in the next operation. So all of the components need to briefly come apart to give access to this lower edge. A couple of light strokes on an India stone is enough to separate the burr from the workpiece, and then it's good to go again. The parts go back onto the fixture as before, and this time we have the recently cut surface to help verify that it's all going into place correctly. OK, so that's the outer perimeter surface complete. And that surface finish would be quite OK exactly as is. But interestingly, this steel takes an excellent grain from an abrasive stone. And graining the surface really does take the presentation up a notch. It doesn't take much effort. Just a couple of strokes on each side, while making sure to maintain the alignment of the part with each stroke. Now that's two of the jaw sets complete, but of course a minimum of three are required. Certainly there'd be no harm in completing another two to give four in total. It'd keep the fixture balanced and leave an extra on hand as a spare. 
but equally the fixture will happily hold just one at a time meaning that individual clamp jaws can be conveniently produced on demand, as required in the future. The top surface of the upper jaws also requires a turning operation. And the same fixture can be used, with some of the same fixing hardware, but this time using the centre hole as the locating reference. And of course there needs to be a way to conveniently determine when the final depth of cut has been reached. A marked outline would work great, but in this case I used a piece of scrap brass of the cracked thickness as a simple gauge. Those sharp corners will get some attention at the final step, but for now it's enough to give the holes a light deburr. And this brings us to the third use of the fixture, which is to help form the remaining curved surface. This time it definitely makes sense to clearly scribe the work with markings, on those two planes where the cut must simultaneously end. Again, some of the same locating hardware applies, as well as an additional plug that fits snugly inside the recessed section of the workpiece. This prevents the work from rotating away from the cutting tool during the cut. Now there are a couple of ways to approach this next operation, with various methods of bringing a cutting tool to bear on the workpiece. One of which is to use the rotary table, in the upright position and then use the edge cutting ability of an end mill in combination with the rotating workpiece. The cut starts at the exposed corner of the workpiece, and then the tool is worked in towards the axis of the fixture, all while monitoring progress towards the two lines marked out previously, with the intention that on the final pass, the cuts end up just short of each line. And I say just short, because there's an opportunity to make this surface a standout feature of the tool. Again, it'd be quite okay to leave the tool marks as is. But by leaving on a small allowance, they can be taken out with abrasive paper. 
In this case, I've bonded a piece of 600 grit abrasive paper onto a length of brass stock of the same diameter as the cutting tool. A couple of passes brings the part to final dimension. It leaves behind a bright textured grain that contrasts well with the other grained surfaces on the part and catches the light in an interesting way. And so that just leaves the final tidy up and deburring of edges. Fine abrasive stones work well to take the edge off the corners and give a bright presentable bevel with each edge getting just enough attention to ensure a consistent bright flash runs along each edge as it's turned towards the light. The convenience of using a fixture to make these parts means that it'll be easy to make additional jaws and perhaps other custom support fittings if required in the future. I'll wait and see if that's something I need later. In the meantime, that's the three main jaw sets complete. In the next episode, I'll make the rest of the bits and pieces to complete the clamp assemblies. Thanks for watching. I'll see you later.